Let's pray. Jesus, come. We, we can read your word, we can think, we can use our brains, but we really won't get out of this what you have for us without your Holy Spirit. So please come, we pray. Amen. God calls us to walk one way while the world's headed diametrically the other. You know, just a couple of days ago, the shooting in Roseburg, one of the things that's coming out of that from survivors is he asked everyone, are you, stand up, are you a Christian? And if they said yes, he shot him in the head. What would you do if you were the next in line? And he said, are you a Christian? After you just saw the previous one be shot. This kind of made one think. Am I really on board for the Lord? Would I think this is too small of a place to stand up? Or is it time to stand up? I don't know. 44-year-old Adventist member of the uh, Grants Pass Church was killed in that shooting. Um, so it hits kind of close to home. I mean, for God, we're all his kids, but one of ours, you know, one of our locals, one of our church members. We're called to walk a different direction, no matter what the cost. Make God all in everything. To live according to the word of God, the Torah, and let our lives be a living testimony. That's what God called Isaiah to do, and Isaiah ended up giving his life for that. And God calls us to do the same, even to the point of giving up our lives. So we've been asking ourselves, do we really believe what the Torah says about origins and about morality? We're still in the morality section. We've got some presuppositions we've laid down over the last few months. We're made in the image of God, not the image of beast. Our hearts were made in and for paradise, not an evolutionary struggle. We can't improve on paradise. When we try, that's called sin. We only break things. Human history is one of regression, devolution, falling apart. We are not getting better. And how we differ from paradise reveals our brokenness, and we are all broken. Marriage, God bringing two together as one flesh. We had a wedding here last Saturday afternoon, and in that wedding, we very deliberately only did the God thing. It had nothing to do with the government. We didn't sign a wedding license or anything. They can do that down at the courthouse. It was about God, and that's the way I'm doing weddings anymore. Because God said, I will make the two of you one flesh. Government can do one property, civil marriage. Marriage in our world today no longer has anything to do with spirituality. It's just a government contract. It's just a legal contract. No, it's from the word of God. God started it before there was a government. Amen? Humans can do one body, have sexual relations. God only can do one flesh. It's a creation miracle. God split humanity, Adam, into two gender-specific individuals. Then he brought them back together. Both are miracles. We can't do either one. We couldn't split one into two. And how well have we done at bringing two into one when we do it our way? We're always falling apart. God says, let me make the two of you one. And it's only within God making that larger one flesh union solid, gluing it up. We make the commitment, but God sets the cement. <laughs> right? Our commitments, God won't set the cement without our commitment, but our commitments won't hold if he doesn't set the cement. And the only one safe place for us to enter into the intimacy of sexual oneness is within the larger context of God having already made us two into one on a deeper and wider level so that whatever happens then physically is within a permanent bond and we don't end up broken and pieced out and parted out. Torah stories. We've been looking at the stories, watching how the social roles and moral rules are fleshed out in real lives. And today we're going to do some more of that and actually get into looking at a couple of the rules on something as well. We're approaching it from a regressive devolutionary wor worldview. In other words, we're not getting better. We have fallen. Looking back, we're not looking at cavemen. That's not archaic stuff that we've passed a long time ago. That's actually closer to the original. So we're looking back humbly instead of arrogantly at the instructions of the past. God's laws, I believe, are intrinsic reality. They're not imposed restrictions. They simply describe how life works on an eternally sustainable level. 
And the bottom line is, do we actually trust God with life here and now? Do we believe we'll find the fullest life living out his ways now? Or do we think we'll find the fullness of life living out our natural broken feelings and selves? The bottom line is the world's way. The line above that is God's way which really brings life. That's the decision that we make as Christians. It's not about being good. It's about where we believe we'll find life. So today we want to talk about divorce, the first divorce in the Bible. You know where the first divorce is? Well, let's go back to the story of Abraham, chapter 16. Chapter 16, Abraham and Sarah have been down in the land of Canaan now for 10 years. 10 years before, at least, God had promised them that through their descendants, they would become a great nation. The problem was they didn't have any kids. Sarah, or Sarai at the time, was unable to conceive. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. That last phrase is interesting because it not only says they'd been there ten years, it says at the end of 10 years. It's almost like she's been counting up. I'll give God time to come through. But how long do you wait for God to bring the answer? Have you ever waited 10 whole long years for something? I got a friend whose business is struggling right now. He's trying to leave it in God's hands. What do I do? Should I switch and do this? Should I switch and do that? Sent him an email yesterday. I said, you said you're putting the business in God's hands. Don't switch and do anything. Just keep going until God makes a switch. Because the other thing he's been saying is how can I find, you know, he's middle age now, I'm still saying, how do I find God's plan for my life? Am I sure I'm doing God's plan? What's my mission? What's my purpose? I realize it's not just to succeed in business. I realize it's not just to be well known as a professional. I realize it's not just to make money. How do I know what God's plan is? What should I do? And the business is faltering. I said, I think God is saying, borrow no more money. <laughs> don't prop it up yourself. Secondly, don't jump ship to another option. Stay the course until God brings a shift. He'll either cause the business to float or he'll take it down and he'll show you where to go. But you've got to wait. We always have a plan. Well, I could do this. Well, I could do that. Well, I could do something else. Do we ever wait? You're right, we don't. Well, we'll wait a month or two or three or four, maybe a year. You know, you're praying God will bring that man or that woman into your life. How long are you going to wait? Before you decide to go get on the Internet and look for somebody. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong to look. On the flip side, 
Have you decided you're only going to take someone that fits the qualifications God says you should have and wait for him to bring them? One of the things I've suggested to single people, and that is um, go get involved in ministry. Stop looking for a mate and go get involved serving the Lord doing something. And you know what? You may just find somebody else who gets involved doing the same thing and you end up coming side by side. Look for service. Look to serve the Lord. Let God worry about those things. Now, that's easy for me to say. Happily married 36 and a half years. You know, I have it all, right? I do. Got the best wife. She's already taken, so you guys all have to go for second best. <laughs> but the point is, how good are we at waiting? And you think about this. Sarah, it says at the end of 10 years. Not just 10 years, but at the end of 10 years. It's almost like she, she this, this phrase up here in uh, chapter 16, verse 2, where it says um, in the New King James, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. It, it almost could be translated, Look, please. You know, like she's got her hands on her hips and she says, Look, please, try to understand. Ten years. God's prevented me from bearing. We better come up with another plan. You, uh, I get the feeling that probably Sarah did not decide to give her maid to her husband as a second wife on a whim. This was probably... Took her a long time to finally come to where she was that desperate. She says, look now, God's restrained me from giving, from bearing. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I'll obtain children by her. And it says, Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. A Near Eastern common practice in patriarchal times was that if a marriage proved un unfertile, infertile, the husband usually took matters into his own hands. But on occasion, we have data from the ancient archaeological records that women would actually, an infertile wife, would go and present one of her slave girls to her husband by which to produce children. In fact, it was known that at times a wife would go out and buy a new slave girl for this. You see, designer babies are nothing new. <laughs> you know, you say, well, let's see, if I'm not going to produce the child, what do I want the mom to look like? <laughs> you know, we're going to do blonde blue eyed or dark hair brown eyed, what are we going to do? Um, women would actually select a slave girl or buy one to be, and of course, the idea was the girl is owned by the, by the head woman in the household who can't have babies, so the babies are hers. They belong to the, to the owner, not to the slave. Slaves don't own anything. So if your slave has a child, it's your child. That was kind of the legal mumbo jumbo of it all. And so Sarah is not really doing anything unusual in terms of her society. But have you ever discovered that when you're in sync with your society, you're seldom in sync with the Lord? These wives for the purpose of producing children often went by the name concubine mating for the purpose of a baby. So, you know, when Sarah said to Abram, why don't you go have sex with my young maid here? <clears throat> he said, okay. And it says that, verse 3, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram, to be his wife. Now, 
This is interesting. There are a couple of parallels I want you to see. Verse 3, literally in the verb, she took, Hagar the Egyptian, and she gave her to Abram, her man. The word man, remember, there's no dedicated word for husband. It means just her man, her husband. And then backing up to verse 2, and he listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, I put him in that order for a reason. She took, she gave, he listened. Is there any other place in the Bible where she took, she gave, and he listened? <laughs> Genesis 3, and she, Eve, took from its fruit. It's exactly the same in the Hebrew. And she gave also to her man. It's the same in the Hebrew. And then you go down to verse 17, and God says, because you listened to the voice of your woman. <laughs> the, the, remember, the same author, Genesis 3, Genesis 17, or G Genesis 16. The author seems to be trying to say something here. Just as Eve came up with a bright idea for Adam, and I'm not saying, I, I do not believe this women are morally inferior thing, okay? I'm not going there. But Eve got schnookered by the serpent into believing God's holding out if I stay with God's way, I'm going to miss out on some life. I've got to take off on my own way. And Adam, and she says she gave to her man that was with her. Why didn't he speak up? Why didn't he speak up and say, no, no, that's not the right thing. Put it down. Let's go the other way. Let's trust God. But Adam was silent, the silence of men has been deafening. We're usually noisy when we shouldn't be and silent when we... Let's see. I, yeah, did I say that right? We're noisy when we shouldn't be and silent when we shouldn't be. Um, we really don't want to disp disappoint you ladies, right? Guys, you know the pressure, the pressure of not... bucking the tide sometimes. And here you have a clear parallel in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the wording and the layout of this whole passage. Here we have it again. Sarah is having trouble trusting God. God's holding out ten whole years. God's holding out. We got we to gotta fix this ourselves. Now, Abraham is this man of faith. God said, Abraham, go, leave Ur of the Chaldeans. Leave your home, leave your family, and just go, and I'll show you when you've gotten there. Now, I kind of like vacations that way. We almost did that this time. We did more of that than usual. We kind of made it up as we went. Usually vacation is, you know, you drive all the way to Montana in two days and you spend three days with this relative and then you drive to Idaho and you spend four days with that relative and then you drive all the way over here and see that one and then you try to make it home and you're just exhausted. I remember a few years ago, we, uh, in fact, I think it was the first year we were here, we heard there was a great place to camp up on the upper log or lower log river up near uh, Sholo. And... Uh, we were going to go there and camp for a couple days, and then we were going to maybe drive on up to Uray, Colorado or somewhere and do this or that. We ended up camping there for 10 days. We just sat there, you know, made it up as we went. Did a little side trip here and a little side trip. That's okay for a vacation, but if, if, if God says to you, go, and I'll show you when you've got there, just go. What would we say? God, when you tell me where I'm going, I'll start out. How, am I, how do I know what road to take if you haven't told me where I'm going to end up? He just says to Abraham, go. And Abraham believed God. God said to Abraham, go, and I'll give you a land, and I'll make you a great nation. He believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. But 10 plus years later, we don't really know how many years later. 
Because you see, the trip from Ur went from Ur up to Haran, which is way up north, almost on the eastern end of Turkey. It's way up north there. It's not down in the Palestine. And, it, you know, he and, he and his father and family, they went to Haran. In fact, it's kind of funny because Haran is the name of the deceased brother. So they didn't go to Haran. They went up there and found a place that ended up being named Haran after the deceased brother. <laughs> and it's a beautiful valley area. It's very fertile at the time. And they hung out there. We don't know how long. We don't know how long it was from when Abraham left Ur and got to Haran that he stayed there. But at some point, Terah, his father, died. And then God said, now move on. You're not there yet. You got stalled out. And now, at age 75, he heads south into Palestine, into, the, into uh, the area now of Israel. And that's when the clock starts that we know. So since God said go, and <clears throat> it's been way more than 10 years. Might have been 12, 15, even more. But since he headed south, it's been 10 whole long years. And he's been wandering. And he moves his tent from here to there, and he builds an altar and worships, and then he moves over here and digs a well and builds an altar and worships. And he's, he's moved around all through the countryside there in uh, what is now southern Palestine area. He's been following God's call to go until God says you're there. And God finally says, okay, this is the land I'm going to give your descendants. He says, yeah, right. I don't have any kids. Maybe, I guess, Eliezer, my, my chief uh, servant, slave, he'll, he'll have to be my heir. God says, no, it's going to come from your own body. Oh, okay. Ten years go by. Ten years go by. Abram had the faith to step out and start following the Lord in an amazing level of trust. But ten years in, Sarah says, God's not coming through. We better work it out ourselves. And he says, yes, dear. I guess we all have our limits. Now, one other thing I want to show you from this. This is a marriage. I've read different authors. They say, well, it wasn't really a marriage. It was just this, uh, you know, just the concubinage... Um, um, and interesting, God never, God never refers to Hagar as a wife. God always refers to Hagar in the several places he does as a servant. But I want you to notice something. It says in verse 3 that Sarah took Hagar, her maid. That word took is the same word used all through Scripture for he took a woman, which means he took a wife, he married a wife. It's the same took. And she gave her to Abram, her man. It's the same gave as a father gave his daughter to this man as wife. So it's the same, he took a woman as wife, the father gave the woman to him as wife, and then the third phrase um, where it says in verse 3, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. It, it's, I, I know it looks strange on the screen, to him, to woman. That, the three places I've got two underlined is the same Hebrew preposition. It's the, it's the letter lambda, which means two or four. So literally, she gave her to Abram, her man, to him, to woman. Or for him, for woman. And, and all I'm saying is this is the formula used all through in the Hebrew to say he took a wife, he was given a wife, she was given to him as a wife. This is all the right language to match. This has all the formula for being a marriage. So he married a second wife at the suggestion of his first wife and chosen by his first wife for the purpose of fulfilling God's promise and having the child God just wasn't coming through on. 
Verse 4, he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she, Hagar, saw that she had conceived, her mistress, mistress became despised or small in her eyes. Hagar copped an attitude. I'm no longer... I'm no longer a slave. In fact, I'm no longer the lesser wife because I'm the one who produced the child. I'm the one who's now going to be the top dog. And so Sarah said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. You know, when we set out to do it our way, and plans don't work out right, we have to blame somebody, don't we? In the Garden of Eden, Adam said, it's not my fault, it's hers. She said, it's not my fault, it's a serpent. Here, she said, we now have tension in the home. My slave is acting up. And she said, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. That's pretty heavy stuff between a husband and a wife. This is not happy camping time. And Abram said to Sarah, Yes, dear. Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Now think about it. She is pregnant with the child Abraham has been wanting for 85 years. And Abram has to say, do with her as you wish. He can't seem to stand up to Sarah. And Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar, and she fled from her presence. So the slave, bearing the child in her womb, ran away. Give you an idea of the lay of the land. Um, Jerusalem didn't exist then, but there's where it is in the, on the map up there to the center right. Um, the place where Abraham was living is that area called the Negev, which means the south. He spent a lot of time hanging around Beersheba. He spent some time hanging around Hebron area, and he spent some time hanging around Kadesh. In fact, at one point it says he was between Kadesh and the wilderness of Shur. So that whole southern area seems to be where we're at here. And it says the angel of the Lord found Hagar, verse 7, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Hagar was an Egyptian. Shur is right on the eastern edge of Egypt. <clears throat> Hagar ran away, and she was going home. And she's by a spring on the road. So she's not lost at this point. She's not necessarily out of food and water. She's by a spring. She's got water. But the angel of the Lord found her there. Now, what, I've, I, what I think is interesting here, folks, is this is a slave girl. She has no rights. She's a nobody. But she's God's daughter. Now, I don't understand slavery and freedom and we haven't talked about that yet in the whole issue here. One of the big things that, you know, secular people pick at the Bible for is, why would God allow slavery? There's no justice here. So that's old, that's bad, we don't want it anymore. And I'm not suggesting we bring slavery back. But the word slave could be everything from being the chief employee to being an owned cook and bottle washer. Everyone had to be part of a household. And everybody couldn't be the head of the household. The society back then just didn't have kind of the employer-employee thing where everybody had their own single-family dwelling 
as it were, and, and everybody kind of lived an independent life and got a wage to live independently like we do now. If you weren't part of a household, you really, in a, an agrarian society like this, you, you really didn't have a way to live. So the, the, the slavery thing was a way for everybody to have a home. Now, it was horribly abused at times. But you'll remember when Abram uh, went after the kings that came down and took the people of Sodom, it says he armed his 318 slaves. Now, if they hate your guts because you're abusing them, you don't arm them. <laughs> right? So that tells us to be a slave in the household of Abraham was not necessarily a horrible thing. It was to be employed, have food, clothing, and shelter. You could probably, you know, get married, have children. You're a family. You're not free to leave. In fact, if you leave, you don't know where you'd go. And you work for food. You work for your living. But you're part of the mix. You're part of it all. But you don't have the same rights. I, I, I'm not defending it, and yet we need to understand it's a kind of society that we don't fully understand, and we shouldn't sit in our high and mighty and decide it's terrible and we do things a lot better. I'm not sure we do things much better. The employer is still the master, and often the employee is little more than the slave. Um, but who finds the slave girl? God does. And he said to Hagar, he said, notice verse 8, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? <laughs> he calls her by name. He names her mistress and her state of employment, Hagar, Sarai's maid. Where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel said to her, Return to your mistress, mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Now it's interesting. If you go back up to verse... Six, where it says Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar it literally is Sarah afflicted Hagar it's the same word used for affliction when the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites in slavery treating harshly now the angel says in verse 9 return and literally afflict yourself under her hand. It's interesting, the word submit there is the word afflict. It's a very interesting word because you see, if you choose to submit, that's a willing thing. But if you are submitted, that's forced from top down. And when the word is used for being forced from top down, it's a grievous affliction slavery. When the word is used from you submit bottom up, it's submission. It's all in your attitude. Return and submit yourself unto her. Verse 10, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they will be counted as a multitude. It's like she says, look, you're carrying Abraham's child. I promised him his children would become a multitude. Yours will. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, you will bear a son. They didn't know the gender yet. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. The word, name literally means God hears. And he'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. Every man's hand against him. And he'll dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Now notice verse 13. She called the name of Yehovah who spoke to her, you are the God who sees. Who showed up? 
God didn't even send a messenger. He came himself to rescue a slave girl who was being ill-treated. I love that. God shows up. She called, therefore, the well was called Beer, which is well. There was no beer in that well, okay? Beer Lahai Roy, the well of the one who sees me. And Agar bore Abram a son, and Abram named him, as God had told Hagar, Ishmael, and Abraham was 86 years old. Now, it's interesting. Hagar is caught in this thing. And God says, go back, submit yourself, trust me, I'll take care of you. Okay. Next chapter, God tells Abram again, you and Sarah are going to have a child. Oh, he says, oh, that Ishmael might be before me. God says, no, it's not Ishmael. Out of Sarah's body, you're going to have a child. And it says that when God told him that, Abraham laughed. He did. I'm trying to find the spot. I just can't see it. Verse 17. Well, God says to Abram, your, your, your name is no longer Abram. Your name is Abraham. Your name no longer means um, um, blessed father. It means father of nations. Hi, what's your name? Father of nations. Oh, really? Got any kids? No. <laughs> and he says, Sarah is no longer going to be Sarai, but she is going to be Sarah, which means princess. Verse 16, I will bless her and also give you a son by her, and I will bless her, and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. And Abram fell on his face and laughed and said, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Because he's 99 at this point. By the way, after the birth of Ishmael, God let another dozen years go by. Abram, are you going to wait? Shall Sarah bear a child when she's 90? Verse 18, Abram said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God is, Abram is saying, I don't believe you. Here's the child, Ishmael. And God says, No. Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. Call his name Isaac, which means laughter. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? And I will establish my covenant with him and his descendants. But I'll also bless Ishmael because he's your son. And then you have chapter 18 where the, within just a couple of months evidently, because God says that next year at this time Sarah will have a child, and then these two, three travelers come and we study that passage and Abram feeds them and they say Sarah's going to have a child. At the time I said, and Sarah laughs too, and God says, why did you laugh? She says, I didn't, and he says, but you did. And they move on, and you have the Sodom and Gomorrah story, and we go to chapter 21. So a lot happened while Sarah was conceiving and pregnant. You've got the whole Sodom and Gomorrah thing. It happens during the gestation of Isaac. In verse 21, And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to, for Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham, a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Spoke to him in chapter 17, spoke to her and him in chapter 18, and right on time, little laughter is born. And Abraham called the name of the son that was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. The whole covenant of circumcision came in chapter 17. By the way, that means Abram was circumcised when he was 99 and Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13. Try to get a 13-year-old to do that. <clears throat> and Abram was 100, verse 5, 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. And Sarah said, 
God has made me laugh so that I, so that all who hear will laugh with me. Literally, they will Yitzhak with me. And Isaac's name is Yitzhak. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I had borne him a son in his old age. Obviously, Sarah was pretty excited about this, right? So the child grew and was weaned. Now, there's some evidence uh, in ancient times that some children, you know, some societies, they don't wean their children until five or six years old. It seems that, at least from some of the Hebrew writings around the time of Christ, the rabbis, they figure this was 18 months to two years. So how old is Ishmael? He's 14 when Isaac was born. So he's 15, 16 years old, if you go with a short time for the weaning of Isaac. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. Seems like a strange time to have a feast. The kid's going to be screaming and yelling because he wants mama and he's going to get told no, and now you're going to have a feast. Maybe all the men had a great time. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, this 15, 16-year-old kid, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. It's another word for laughing. And, and the context here seems to be derisive. So, Hagar, I mean Sarah, her son, they're having a big party. He's being weaned. The kid's growing up. Entering the terrible twos, you know, he's, here we go. And she looks over and the teenage from the other wife is laughing at the baby. Now you get the feeling here that she says rivalry is going to happen here. It's a Vishmael saying, yeah, the little kid, I'm the firstborn. And once again, Sarah doesn't wait for God. She said to Abram, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. Now, how do you think that hit Abraham? His wife, who came up with the bright idea in the first place and says, it's your fault, now says, banish your son. The matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight, verse 11, because of his son. Doesn't seem that Hagar was the big issue here. Seems to be the son. Now, God said to Abram, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to his voice. Listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be named. Ah. God says, you listen once, <laughs> you listen twice. I'm telling you, listen this time. Now, this time it wasn't easy to listen. Because this time it was his boy. It's almost like, Abram, you got yourself into this. Now, you've got to trust me with this. Let me get you out of it. You have to trust me with your son. Heed your wife, send him away. Yet, verse 13, I will make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he's your seed. What's God saying? Go ahead. This is a complication I need to deal with. These two can't grow up together. Isaac's to be the seed. You have to let go of your own creation. So it says Abraham evidently slept on it because it says he rose early in the morning, he took bread and 
a skin of water. He took provisions. He provisioned Hagar for the journey, wherever they were going. Probably back to Egypt. So he gave her food, skin of water, evidently enough to get from well to well. Put it on her shoulder and he gave it to the gave the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And it says she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Once again, the well she was found at, by the way, you know, 16 years before, was right near Kadesh. It appears now that she was wandering a little north of there in the area called the Negev of the south. The word wander suggests that she got lost this time. So she wasn't making it down the road from well to well. And the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Now this is a little hard to understand because this is a 16-year-old kid at least. Now maybe they grew up a little slower back then. We seem to be growing up pretty fast now. So maybe a 16-year-old then was like an 8-year-old now or a 10-year-old. I don't know. But it says she cast the boy under a bush. <laughs> it's an interesting word. Like she <laughs> put him under the bush. Um, she put him in some shade. They're out of water. They're in the wilderness. And she went and sat down about a bow shot away, you know, about a football field length. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. She's desperate. This is it. I mean, they've wandered to the point where they're dying. She lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. This time he didn't, she didn't see God show up, but he called to her, Hagar, fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Then she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife from the land of Egypt. Now, obviously, they survive because he ends up having 12 sons. Interesting, 12. He ends up living to be 137. You can read all this in chapter 25. He ends up coming back to help bury Abraham with Isaac. They weren't like warrior hatred the whole time. And at one place, it says with the, with the 12 sons that the area they covered now as the family grew was all the way from the wilderness of Shur, clear over by Egypt, the wilderness of Paran, that whole swath, and down to some place called Havilah, which we have no idea where it is, but it was probably down in Arabia. So he, he comes to be a large clan, and it says he dies in the presence of his people. Now here's, here's the point we've got to close for today. Just as there's a marriage formula here, took, gave to him to woman. So we have the divorce formula. Because you see, when it says, Sarah said, cast out the bondwoman, garash is one of the two major words used for divorce in the rest of the Old Testament. A divorced woman is a cast out woman. And then it says, Abraham sent her away, shalach. The word shalach is to send away, and that's the other word, word for divorce. So we're going to pick up here next week, and I'll show you. We'll go through the passages in the Old Testament on divorce. But this is the first divorce. And God said, send her away. So we now have a God-sponsored divorce. I mean, this does get a little interesting, because if God hates divorce, Malachi 2... And yet he says, send her away. Nobody broke in the marriage vow. Nobody had sex with the wrong person. There's no adultery. And yet God says, send her away. So, mm, what do we do with this? Stay tuned. 
because we're out of time. And we'll pick it up next week. One thing I think we can say is most of the time, the things that don't work are the things we got ourselves into and didn't wait for God to work it out for us. Does that make sense? We decided to find our own way into a career. It doesn't work. We decided to find our own mate and do it our way. We chose mate and career before we chose God, and then somewhere down the line we need God. We've already messed up the other two because we didn't follow him to start out with. Does that make sense? And sometimes, God, we want rules for everything, and that's the thing that's got me here, folks, is this kind of blows some of the rules. I mean, doesn't God give rules for divorce? You don't divorce unless this... The very first divorce listed in Scripture doesn't have any rules, except that they got themselves into something that God had to somehow extricate, and when you get yourself into stuff, there is not an Edenic ending for every mess we make. Sometimes there's a lot of heartache. And yet God says to Hagar, I'll take care of you. And he does. Even though he says to Abram, go ahead. You're going to have to send her away. He's not the son of promise. Jesus, forgive us for seldom even waiting 10 years. Much less 25 Forgive us for jumping the gun and causing complications that even you can't get us out of without some heartache. But thank you for taking care of the different parties in the messes we make. And that no matter which end of the stick we're on, the one casting out or the one being cast out, if we'll finally turn it over to you, you will take care of your people. You will take care of your kids, whether they're the landowner or the slave, the patriarch or the maid. May we take whatever mess we've made out of our lives today and hand it over to you and trust you to walk us through it to a better place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.